Hello friends. How are you how how are you all doing? This is coach Bala here. Uh man, we are here. The last week of peak meso cycle is today. And the very fact that all of you uh, are still here, still running, still training, many of you have finished your uh, long runs and yet some have actually finished their pre-planned races. It is not like, I, I, I specify pre-planned because this is not like last minute suddenly going and just going and doing a race. That's not what we believe in. You guys plan for it. Accordingly, I just said the training and completed many of the races. We started seeing some informations coming out. This is going to be an exciting end to an exciting season. Congratulations, all of you. We are in the final business end of this season. What an achievement. This is always uh, a time when we all kind of, you know, incredulously look back and say, oh my God, what happened in the last 14 or 15 weeks now? Uh, and this is what has happened, folks. You committed, you dedicated, you were resilient, and you did try to have fun as well in the process. And as a result, you are here fitter, uh, uh, hotter, uh, more energetic, more mentally, uh, you know, fresh, uh, and of course, physically fresh and ready to go. That is what has happened, an inside out transformation. Very, very happy for you. And this applies to everybody, not just for uh, first time runners. See, this is what happens, guys, when you work hard on anything results will follow okay so that's where we are and uh, first of all thank you for all the um, you know get well soon messages uh, that i received uh, thank you guys yes i was uh, down and out pretty badly this virus even now i would say i'm 90 percent there i'm uh, still coughing a little bit i'm still weak i'm not sort of running this virus sort of seems like one one of those um, you know very unique uh, virus Talking of cough, here you go. So, but I'm 90% I'm there. Uh, should be okay in the next couple of days. And uh, thanks for all the well wishes and help and all that good stuff. A lot of things to talk today. So I'm going to summarize this as much as possible. Some important theory that I'm going to talk about, which I want all of you to think about. And some logistical stuff. So let's take the logistical stuff out of the way. First thing is, today is 7th. Next weekend, the first time in RHWB history, we'll be having our first official RHWB managed and, uh, and uh, provided race in Dallas for folks in that region. I understand about uh, almost close to uh, 100 folks have signed up for it, which is just mind blowing for me. I cannot wait to go there and meet all our uh, Dallas based and Houston based and other the, uh, people around who are all coming there, meet them run with them, interact with them, and it's going to be fun. Thank you for all those organizers out there. All our Texas coaches are there. We're going to have GV Ganesh, who is also going to be helping us. So thank you, guys. I mean, we get there, and then we'll slowly build it. Who knows? Maybe next time we'll open up another chapter in California. So we have three races. How cool is that? So I can't wait to get there. Me and Reno will be there representing our East Coast friends and can't wait to see and uh, sort of connect with all of you. Those of you who are still around that area, uh, if you haven't signed up for it, I think you should sign up for it. It helps the organizers to figure out because uh, conducting a race, trust me, guys, it's a logistical work. And we need to know how much, how many people are running. That's the first thing. You can't do last minute. If you do, that uh, just adds up to the, uh, the work and problems for the organizers. So do your part. The next one is our final race day, the season-ending race day, which is a tradition in runners eye. The 20th, which is the Saturday, I'm looking at the calendar. Yeah, 20th Saturday. Um, do register. Looks like about 100 of you have already registered there as well. Last two more weeks to go. We're expecting another 100 registrations. Yourself, your friends, your family, all of us are invited. This is a celebration of Runner's Eyes community. It's not just a race. There's no think of it as any other race. This is all of us coming, meeting each other, saying hi to each other, going for a run, supported by runners I pit stops with uh, volunteers providing you, among other things, love and affection and cheering 
and then you have folks who are on the bikes giving you waters as you are uh, running the course and the course is such a beautiful course because it's springtime flowers are blo blooming both sides there is a canal and you have got this trail in the middle of the canal so both sides water and you are in the middle it's almost a dream scenario you have crossing guards you have a medical tent you have a recovery tent a uh, lunch provided then there's going to be a chief guest giving you medals uh, bollywood uh, uh, you know dance uh, sort of workout kind of thing to get get you started a little bit warmed up drone cameras photographers <coughs> massage parlors for folks i mean guys none of this is i could say needed but we do it only because we just want to do it because it's just so much of pleasure doing this okay so you got to sign up if you are in and around the new jersey and even in the past people have uh, traveled for this event from as far as kansas and even west coast you got to come all the coaches will be there just to meet with all of you and it's a nice tradition so it the uh, uh, one thing i always hear after these race dates are sixth or seventh or eighth race day event we are conducting is one thing we always hear after the race days man it was a high for all of us it felt like we are meeting our family you know so you cannot miss that it doesn't matter whether you have signed up for other races this can be your training race this can be just come and walk bring your friends who are maybe considering for next season just say they don't do anything just come and walk bike it let them experience it many of us in the running group they all joined like that like i give you an example coach indu she didn't know anything much about rhwb she came and joined the race day as just a regular runner and she said oh my god i got to be here and then uh, within a couple of seasons she was a coach so that's what i'm talking about so please come sign up register your friends all of you should come let's enjoy together and we go from there okay so um the registrations are still open by wednesday we need uh, like wednesday of uh, april 17th we will be closing it because we need to organize for lunch and all so just go and get it done so that is for the race day event now for volunteers so for every race day we have we need about 50 to 60 volunteers and we have a volunteer pool it's always important it's a lovely give back to the community thing and a lot of people are in fact very they like to do that it it gives them a lot of pleasure yeah, like it does for me too so i would like uh, if you are interested in volunteering we are going to send a message today evening if you want to join the volunteer pool uh, i we will tell you exactly what is required by what position and then we have volunteer team captains and we'll be allocating you to a key team captain please do consider if you are free if you have, can't run for whatever reason or if your friends want to volunteer too they can also experience that's another route people have come and volunteered first and then joined the community a lot of people are there like our unknown photographer he came into volunteer to photograph uh, first and he said what the hell is this man i love this energy and he said became a runner uh, many such examples are there so you can do that too ask your family if they want to volunteer like kids like teenagers who want volunteering hours for the applications it's a great opportunity to give back as well as we'll provide you certificates for volunteering hours all of that is good some especially kids who want to help in pacing like you know we have a special team uh, called finishers so they basically wait at the last one mile and run along with you for uh, give you the motivation to come and finish the race which other race does that we do it all run by runner side so we need some runners who are like young energetic folks who can do the enthusiasm and you know give the energy and just get people to the finish line uh, so we need, we have so if you are one of those youngsters who want to help out like run maybe 8 to 9 miles in breaks like go back come back go back like that uh, you know sign up for it we'll give you all information so that's a uh, race day sign up i want to see all of you there at least we have 200 folks normally every year and we need that this time as well i need to see that energy okay do that for me do that for us do that for yourself um okay so those are the logistical things uh, the last one is every season ending we also have a race day webinar which is giving you kind of how to get your head around race day uh, always a good thing even if you are like 20 season uh, 20 race uh, veteran good to hear it out i do that every time i learn something new so our coaches sharik um coach shrikanth and coach <laughs> abhishek 
will be uh, conducting this webinar next Friday. It'll be a 45 minute webinar on things that you got to tighten it up, things that you got to think about and plan and prepare for race day. And that is coming up. We'll give you more information. Please do join next Friday around 8.30 8 p.m. Eastern time will be the race day seminar or a webinar, okay? So that is another part of the tradition how we kind of get everybody close to the, um, to the race. So all of this is happening, folks. Sign up for race. Thank, uh, uh, sign up for volunteer, uh, volunteering. S uh, be ready for the race day seminar. Three logistics that you all need to be thinking about and just give pat yourself on the back for coming to this point, which is the end of the peak meso cycle. So now let me talk about a couple of other things, some science type. What is, where are you from a body uh, uh, and mental situation, where are you? There are some really couple of Im important themes that I want to share with you. And it's very important. Unfortunately, last season, uh, last weekend, I couldn't give a message. So it might be I'll add all of that and make it short. So the first one I want to talk about is this concept of mental benchmark. So, so, so folks, what happens is that there is a method, as I say, always to this madness of training, isn't it? So what happens is, as you do this structured training, of course, you're physically, you're getting fit. That is happening. But there is one other thing that is happening, which is internal, deep, and more profound, is that you are providing a constant upgrading of your benchmarking, mental benchmarking, that your mind telling you itself and the body that, hey, I'm actually capable of doing this. See, what happens is every time uh, we take on a difficult task, the first sort of speed breaker, especially for adults, the first speed breaker that comes to us is the mind is saying, no, 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 this is not something, you can't do this. Because it's trying to protect uh, the body. That's the mind's job. See, that's the difference between a kid and an adult. A kid will not think. If let's say you ask a kid and an adult who have never done any running before, they go start running. Kid will just start running because there is no mental sort of blocker for the kid. But the, the adult might think, oh my God, see man, like a couple of days ago I did, I had a sprain, I've got to be careful, I have to take care of my heart. I could see that. all these additional knowledge, which is good in many cases, but not good in this case, prevents you from trying or giving the best you can. So as a result, a kid will keep on running and it will stop after some time when the energy is done. Or maybe she's already done one, one mile. But the adult will restrict uh, himself or herself to just 100 meters because, you know, mentally the, the, the blockage is there. So this mental benchmarking works on removing that blockage. So what happens is every time you slowly push the boundaries, your mind is getting it, oh, I can do this. Maybe the next step is difficult, but up to this, I can do it. See, that is why when you started this season, two miles became big. But now you finish a, a peak measure cycle and so many of you in half marathon, let's say I've done 10 miles. You will be like, what the hell happened? I was struggling for three miles and now I'm able to 10 miles. Are you telling me in 14 weeks, I suddenly became so much powerful? Answer is yes to that too, but that was not the only reason. You slowly and steadily push the mental benchmark forward. As a result, if you do 10 miles, then eight miles becomes easy for you. Easy means, you know, I've done it. I can do it again. And this is what happens in a long distance journey. As you keep doing it, tomorrow when you do full marathon, half marathon training for weekends, will not, you will not even think about it. And then you do a couple of full marathons, you know that you can do it because that's how the body sort of sets it up. So that's what I wanted to tell you folks. Mental benchmarking is the game we play and you all on top of it right now. Yeah, if it is whatever you have completed today, that is your mental benchmark and that is sufficient enough to take you to the race day. So that is my first message on this. Now, the second message on this is there is a downside to this enhanced mental strength. Now, if you think about it, mental strength, physical strength. An ideal scenario is your mental strength is always in tune with physical strength. Okay. Now, when you start the season, both mental strength and physical strength are low. So you have problems, right? And then as the season goes up, you, you know, both are racing, 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 racing like that. It's increasing. Now comes a point <laughs> where it takes some extra time for the physical strength to build up because it's physical, right? There's a lot of, you know, muscles have to develop, uh, some injury must have taken place. So physically it takes some time, but there are no such barriers for mental. So what happens is there reaches a point where the mental strength has actually gone much higher than the physical strength, relatively speaking. So you reach a point 
where you are feeling awesome, especially around this time of the training cycle, you feel you can do anything. You can conquer the world of running because mentally you are getting there because every time you finish a peak miss or run, you are like, man, I couldn't believe I did 10 miles and today I did 10 miles. Man, this is great. A full marathon is first time. I never thought I could do 20 miles and today I did 20 miles and same thing goes for 10K. Somebody going and doing a five miles for someone who never thought even one mile was possible. Today she completes five miles. They feel top of the world. So two things happen and a very dangerous two things that I want to caution. First is mentally it will start pushing you to do more things now. Like some will say, hey, let me go and do, you know, next weekend. I know the race is two weeks from now. Why don't I try 12 weeks? Even though Bala has not asked me to do, let me go and do 12 weeks. It's a good practice. I think I can do it. It's a practice for that. Some people say, you know what, let me go and push harder next week, faster, because it's all mentally you're feeling awesome. Unfortunately, folks, physically, you, you, there is a gap still. You got to know that. So if you do a 10-mile run for now, your physical strength has actually gone down because you've, you've put a load on your physique that your body hasn't taken till now. So there are going to be more sort of injuries and such that needs to be mended. Even if it doesn't pain, it is injuries that are there that needs to be mended. You got to give body time. If you don't do that and if you just... Keep your mental strength as your driving force. Disaster is not just likely to happen, it will happen. I take, I've seen enough cases. So let us not be, should I say, penny wise, pound foolish. Let us not try to get these small successes by running faster the next four miles or pushing harder or doing a lot more than what your training is asking you to do and just feel momentary sort of happiness and in the meantime, losing the plot, which is just before the race day had injury or just after the race day injury, that next three months you're out. This is this story we have seen so many times. Even after saying all these things, I can guarantee you there are going to be a 10% of you who will go and do it, get injured, and then they'll get frustrated and they're learning. Unfortunately, that's the learning process. But at least if you are in the remaining 90%, think. See, this is another thing I got to tell you, uh, just uh, putting uh, my modesty aside. See, I've been running now from what? Like, a, you know, structured training for about eight years and unstructured, random myself training for another eight or nine years, right? 2008 or something I started. I have never been debilitated injury for more than one, one and a half months where I could not run for three months. Uh, for uh, many, uh, uh, like, months together. I've always never missed a run uh, injury. Way I'm back pain that this will be unmanaged. That's a, like a sort of inherent pain, but never missed because of overdoing like a stress fracture and things like that. I was asking why. I'm not such a great runner too. The only reason is I always run within myself for some other reason. Even when I was not having a coach, I used to do it because I used to run within myself because I used to enjoy the other parts of running. My uh, thing was never to overdo. But I can now relate that to why I have been largely injury driven, injury um, uh, free. It's only because I've always run within myself and somehow I've given my time for the body to recover, even though mentally I am strong, I know. Because many of the full marathons I've run with mental strength and not physical strength at all. So that's what I'm telling you guys. I'm your prime example for it. I'm touching wood, hopefully, you know, I don't jinx it. But that's really what I'm talking about. Give time for your physical to catch up with your mental. Don't be over enthusiastic. You have it. You just need to now manage it because you are going for the long run of life, pun intended. So that is my message one. Mental strength, physical strength, kind of make sure that you play the unison and you uh, naturally the, um, the uh, alignment game properly. Now comes the next part, which is many people ask, hey, I am going for my first half marathon, but I'm stopping at 10 miles only. Or if you're a first full marathon, you stop at 20 miles only. I've never run beyond 10 miles, but I need to do another 5K. How do I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. Can I just do a training half marathon run? You know, so that I know how I feel. So that in that way, race day, I am like, you know, I know I can do it. The answer is no. You do not, you will never see any training plan in this world that will ask you to run the entire run distance as a training before the race day. Now, the question is why? The question is, the reason is, for two things are going to happen in race day. The Three things, actually. The excitement of race day itself adds one or two miles of extra strength for you. 
You don't even have to think about it. Just two, uh, two miles, just excitement. That itself there. The second one is during race day, you will do things that are more focused towards conserving your energy. Like gels, making sure you have a gel, there is a pit stop, you can drink Gatorade, salt. These are things that maybe in long run, you might be doing it in a suboptimal way, but in a full, in a race day, every two months you have these things. So you are having higher calorie sort of surplus. If you plan it correctly, which I, I know all of you will do. So that is the second additional lever for you to bridge that gap. Thirdly, we the training always tries to address what is the least injury uh, accumulation quotient that we can have before you hit the race day. That means for every time you do a long run, 10 miles, 11 miles, there is an injury that happens to your body. Injury means don't think injury in pain, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about microfibers tearing in the muscle area, which is, has to happen. That's part of training. So we want to reduce the number of fibers that are sort of broken so that, but you are enough for you to finish the 13 mile so that you get to the start line with as high fitness, physical fitness as possible. Mentally, you're there already. Or in other words, if you run 13 miles, let's say, if you run 10 miles, let's say, you had 100 fibers, uh, uh, you know, a tone that needs to be mended. And if you do 13 miles, you had 150 fibers. We want to make sure that we, if, if 100 is enough for, by, because for it to get mend itself by the time of race day, that is good. Why do you want to go 150 and give a chance for 20 to 30 not yet mended? Uh, and then for no uh, further benefit, anyway, you'll be able to do 13 miles if you add up the other two factors. So that is the idea, folks. You know, so we try to, we means everybody, restrict to maximum 10 for 13, 20 for 26, maybe senior runners 22, and then five for uh, six for 10K. That's really and the same thing. And it has played out again and again and again. So don't even think about it. Especially first timers, just trust us. Don't do anything beyond what we're asking you to do at this point of your running cycle. That is message number two. Now, message number three, what happens going forward from now to the start line? What happens is we enter what is called as the taper week. Now, the taper week is, as the name suggests, you're going to reduce the volume. The idea is when you reduce the volume, it's not that your strength or your training impact is going to reduce. Now, when you reduce the volume, <laughs> you are increasing the time for the body to mend all the peak meso damages. That's what you are doing. And you are also allowing the body to settle down a little bit sort of getting into the Zen mode. You don't want to just go and do strides and all that. You are now going for just fine tuning your body a little bit because now your focus is the start line. Okay, so you need the taper. The taper, what it does is in the fit equation I've told before, frequency, interval, and time between runs, this frequency, interval, and time gets, uh, frequency, intensity, and time, this three gets adjusted beautifully so that it gets your body aligned to be in your best possible shape for the start line. That is what is happening. You need to give that, that time for body to be ready for the start line. It is like this, it's a hockey stick. It's, you want to come down a little bit and be ready for the start line and then boom. That is the way you need to do, you know, in a, in a perfect condition. So you got to think about how to do that. That hockey stick down is when your body is just getting ready. It's not like your body is going to state of rest as in a rest, uh, rest week. Taper week is you're actually running. Only thing is you're getting back to the basics. The basics of executing a picture perfect CP. That is where most of the time you're going to run in a race day as well. So that's what you're going to do. And it's going to be fun. After peak day, peak me. So when you go and do taper, you will feel, oh my God, how much I've come. You'll feel good about yourself. Your mental strength will actually increase further. All of this is going to help. Okay. So the, the message is stick to the plan. Don't be, you know, over, uh, you know, thinking and trying to do more things. Don't do it. Trust me, don't do it. Just follow what I'm saying or what we are saying. Okay. So that is that. So, uh, and then last one, I know I too many things I'm saying, but, you know, bear with me, guys. Just want to fill it up for last week. Uh, miss. So I also want to introduce to all of you two advanced concepts, running metrics concepts. 
which around this time, I just tell it to you in a layman's language so that you get to know this. Even those who have heard it before, it's always useful to do a refresher. The idea is these, both these two are what I call it as a derived metric. That means you don't work to improve on this directly. You do all your good stuff, automatically these two will improve. That's basically the idea. The two metrics are lactate threshold and VO2 max. These two are very important advanced running metrics that we all should at least know of. Even if you don't know, want to like manage it too much, you know, that's all for professional senior runners. But for all of us, like for instance, I don't go around checking this on a very regular basis, but I have some ideas for it, which I'm going to share with you today. So let's start with lactate threshold. What are these two and why is it that sort of, it's like the stock price of your physical fitness. That means if everything happens well, finally the in a company, then stock price will reflect it, right? Likewise, if all of your physical fitness is nicely coming together and running, these two metrics improvement will reflect. And you need to understand what that is. So lactate threshold, the easiest way to understand is lactate is a is actually a good molecule. It's a good chemical, which is an energy releasing chemical. But the problem is you can't have accumulation of this lactate chemical in the muscles because it creates soreness and other things. Or in other words, and the lactate gets created when uh, you know energy creation happens in the cellular level. That means as you are running, so lactate is a byproduct of that. So just take this is enough for us to understand. So you don't want, when, so when you're running, the lactate gets produced in the, in the muscles and you want the body to sort of process that lactate or remove the lactate from the muscles so that muscles are supple enough to continue to do the expansion contraction. That's how I would explain this. So if, lact, as the name suggests, if the lactate starts getting accumulated in the muscles or what I mean by that is the rate at which lactate is being produced is higher than the rate at which body is able to take out the lactate from the muscles. Then lactate starts accumulating, right? It's almost like you're having a cup and you have a small hole in the bottom. And uh, let's assume this is the muscle that is working right now. And you're pouring lactate on the, on the top and then from the bottom, the hole, the lactate is going out. So as long as the total quantity or the rate at which you're pouring the lactate from the top is less than the uh, amount of lactate that's going out, no accumulation is taking place. <laughs> but let's assume that the rate at which you're pouring is more than the rate at which uh, the lactate is going out of the cup. What happens? Lactate starts filling, filling, filling. Let it fill, no problem. But till it fills up to the cup, it's okay. But after it fills up the cup, if you cup is not enough for lactate, then the lactate will start uh, overflowing, right? The coffee will start overflowing from the cup because the rate at which you're pouring is much higher than the rate at which it's coming down. That point where it starts overflowing that is called as the lactate threshold. That's a threshold point. Or in other words, that's the place where your muscle gets saturated with lactate. And any further lactate will only cause more problems and soreness and cramps and all those things will start. Or in other words, from a runner standpoint, you don't want to hit the lactate threshold. It can accumulate, but you don't want to hit the lactate threshold because after which the muscles will start giving you problems. So how do you avoid it? Just think logically. One is make sure that you increase the body's ability to remove the lactate. That means increase the hole. That's a slow and steady process. You can't just like switch a button, increase it. That's something as you keep going and running and working out, body will get better and better at lactate uh, processing. Or you reduce the amount of uh, volume of lactate that is coming per say unit time. That is under your control. And that control is if you run in CP. Boom, that's it. If you're in CP runs, you are able to control the flow of lactate. When you do CP runs, when you control the flow of lactate, then you are actually controlling the rate at which the accumulation is happening. That's why we say CP, CP, CP. That's why if you run too fast, at some point, your muscle is like, you know, not ready to support you. Why? You've reached the lactate threshold. That's what it means. Now comes the second beautiful, interesting concept. Now, if you understood this cup analogy, you can also say, since I have a cup, that, that means I have some time before it hits the lactate threshold. How about I manage the accumulation in such a way that I don't hit the lactate threshold by end of the race? That means I can hit it after the race, no problem. Or in other words, why don't I control the accumulation of lactate threshold? That means why don't I run slowly and initially as I come nearer, nearer and nearer to the front finish line, I increase my pace because I know it will increase the accumulation. But since I have only less distance remaining, 
by the time it touches the end, I already finished the race. What did I explain to you just now? That is progressive reverse splits. So when you start slow and go fast later, you are actually able to control the accumulation of lactate threshold as well. Or in other words, you are getting a better chance for a better finish for your uh, sort of um, race. That is lactate threshold, practical application of this very high-end theory. <coughs> so to summarize, lactate threshold is a point where your muscle starts getting saturated with lactate, which is a byproduct of running. So two things as runners you can do. Running more on CP reduces the quantity of lactate that is getting produced. And number two, doing some form of a reverse split will actually help you in delaying the onset of threshold. These two in combination, if you can execute it in a nice way, which you've been doing it all this while, but now I'm giving you the theory behind it, you can actually do and optimize your race day performance. Boom, period. That's all I want you to remember. So that is lactate pressure. Then comes the next metric called VO2 max. Volumetric oxygen max. That's what VO2 max. What it really is, is it just tells you what is the maximum amount of oxygen your body is able to process to support the need of the cardiovascular activity that you're doing. So if you have two human beings, Bala, an amazing runner. Bala can take only 100 units of oxygen max process. The other person has can take 200. Everything else the same. The other person will be able to do much better runs than, the, than Bala here, right? Why? Because he is able to provide a lot more oxygen to his cardiovascular system. That's what it is, right? Or in other words, for a runner, you want to make sure that you can increase the VO2 max as high as possible. That's the idea. <laughs> now, how to increase it is a science. Running more CP, running regularly, having uh, less body weight, drinking water when you're running so you don't get dehydrated. There is, there is a beautiful sort of thought process in it and let's not go into it right now. Doing what you're doing in a consistent manner will increase your VO2 max. If you have a VO2 max uh, measurement, which is very rough in watches, you will see it has increased. But I want you to know that VO2 max is the final ceiling that controls your ability to run. You know, so if you're genetically predisposed with a lower VO2 max, you can't run. You can't be at a higher uh, heart rate. You will have a higher heart rate because the body is struggling, pumping, pumping more. So some people will say, oh, man, why is it that I try my best, my heart rate goes to 170. <laughs> and somebody else is like running like nothing and he's not going anywhere beyond 130. Now, don't feel bad. That is a, there is a genetic component to it. Of course, there are other components as well. But one of the main components we want to make is a genetic component to it. You know, so if your body is like that, so yes, you can manage it. But you can't, if you're running at 170 at a 14 minute mile and you want to somehow get it to 130 because your friend is doing 130 at 12 minute mile, sorry, it's not happening. It'll take some time. So don't get frustrated. Run within yourself is my point. That is the uh, side outcome of this we want to max story. Um, so what I want to say is, one of my friend's son, very interestingly, he has created, see, measuring a VO2 is something very interesting. I'm always interested in doing. So I'm working with him. I want to, at least in New Jersey, but he has created a VO2 measurement lab or maybe various cardiovascular lab. And I am going to get a discount for us. Those of you who are really interested, I think you should go and check it out. I don't think so. It's covered by insurance. Probably it's 100, 150 bucks, something like that. But to get a baseline, uh, I'm going to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll offer uh, where things are. It's like a scientific way to measure all these metrics because it's not easy. Otherwise, all the Garmin watch and all doesn't do the right thing. So I want to do that. I'll come back with you with a little bit more details. Uh, those of you who are like kind of, you know, more interested in knowing about how your body is, you know, you can take like once every year or something and see how that goes. And I think there's something there. It's, a, it's always measurement. Running is all about measurement, right? So that's all I want to say. We want to max the peak oxygen that uh, a body can process. So in summary, folks, I know there's a lot of things I told you. I just want to summarize all my key messages for this weekend. First is congratulations for completing peak meso cycle. That's big. Very nice. Logistically, ensure that you sign up for the race day events, New Jersey and Dallas. Uh, key, bring your friends and family and um, you, know, you can sign up irrespective of whether you have done the race or not. It's not just about running, it's about being with us. Uh, experience the love. That is RHWB. Then if you're uh, willing and able to, you or your friends, please offer your time for giving back to the community in the form of volunteering for this very important day. 
we'll come back to you with uh, exactly requirements where and uh, how. Uh, then we talked about uh, the mental uh, benchmarking, which is at play right now. You are at very high mental benchmark. The downside is make sure that mental strength doesn't is not the reason for your injury by pushing your body more than it needs to. Then I talked to you, talked about why you should stop at 10 miles and 20 miles and not go beyond that because you need your body to recover to be ready for race day. So don't be overzealous and try to do more runs than a, a given. Then I talked about the importance of taper week, which is a controlled reduction of your runs so that your body is now getting better, ready for the start of the race day. Just follow it. Then I gave you two important metrics, the lactate threshold and VO to max, the former being how you need to control your CP as well as uh, progressive reverse split runs to maintain the threshold within the start line, uh, within the finish line. And then finally, the VO to max, the max oxygen that your body can take. It's a, it's a derived metric. It's something that is uh, good to know so that, that's your, that you're also genetically predisposed to that. So you can improve on it by doing all the basic things we are doing, but you can't like suggest target VO to max increase. Yes, you can, but there are so many other things you can do too. So, and then I'm going to offer you uh, a partner organization which measures these in key metrics. Good to have for those of you who want to go the extra mile. I'll with some discounts, I'll give you shortly. So that is pretty much it, guys. I know it's a little longer message with a lot more dense material, but guys, I'm so proud of you. You're here, all of you. Thank you for uh, uh, for being that amazing human being that you all are. Can't wait to see most of you in Dallas and many, many of you in New Jersey shortly. Um, thank you for all your wishes. Be well, stay happy, and let's connect soon. Take care.